But let's start with a, an easy question, which uh, is when should you start interviewing? When should you be looking to actually get a contract, you know, in the medical year that's basically July to July? Right. Yeah, I, we think it's really important to start early because the earlier you start, the more options you hopefully can have and options give you leverage when you're going through your contract for negotiating, whether it's compensation or any other point that you want to get to. So we recommend usually 18 to 12 months at least, you know, for uh, folks that are U.S. citizens and don't have any visa type issues or immigration issues that go along with it. If you are on a J-1 waiver or, um, you know, have any H-1B type issues, 24 months would be kind of the minimum that we would recommend. So 24 months, that's a long time for a resident. I mean, if you're only in a three-year residency, you're talking about getting started as an intern, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. We, uh, we want you to not feel any time pressure when it comes to reviewing these things and to make your decision. Um, we see a lot of clients that come in and just, they feel stuck because they don't have time to find more interviews. And so it's the first time you guys get to choose really, right? There's no match. It's you go wherever you want. And so uh, digging in and, and finding all those positions is really helpful. All right. So the next question I wanted to cover is about letters of intent. Mm -hmm. Are letters of intent binding? They can be. Yeah. So it's not uncommon to have a, a one page document that has about 10 bullet points on it. And the, the employers will ask you if you agree generally with those terms. And if you do, you know, we'll, we'll pass you the full document later. Unfortunately, sometimes those are the contract. There's nothing else really that comes after that. Uh, academic institutions are pretty notorious for that. They have very short letter formatted contracts. And so you really need to be careful. And sometimes it'll say if it's binding or not, and sometimes it won't. So you need to review that carefully and for sure negotiate that prior to signing it if you have any terms that you don't like. I've noticed with doctors, a lot of times they don't get a lot of training in negotiation. And perhaps the biggest consequence of that is they don't realize when they're already in a negotiation. And really from the first contact, the first email you have with an employer or a potential employer or a potential partner, you're already negotiating. And, and doctors assume it's something you do at the end after you see the first version of a contract or something. Yeah. But really the whole process is a negotiation. That's right. Uh, lo looks like so far we've got about 27 people live on here with us. Um, so welcome. Uh, if you have questions, you can type them into the comments. I'm talking here with Kyle Clausen of Resolve Physician Agency, uh, who does a lot of physician contract reviews. Um, so let's talk about red flags. Can mm -hmm. you tell us what uh, what are some red flags in a contract? Maybe what the biggest red flag is in a contract? Sure. For me personally, I think the, the biggest red flag is whether or not you have control of your future. And so we hear horror stories all the time about terms that weren't honored or they told me X in the interview and it turned out to be Y once I got there. And if you don't have the ability to get out of the contract because there's no termination without cause available, um, that to me is the biggest number one. And then the consequences of termination, whether that's a non-compete or tail coverage or golden handcuffs on a signing bonus or something that you need to repay, um, those would be the, the biggest high level things that I think you just need to be real careful before you lock into something like that. Because if you can't get out and it's, and it's not working really, there's nowhere to go other than for you to be in breach of contract. Yeah. Nobody wants to do that. Right. All right. Well, let's take our first question from the audience here. Jay writes in asking when, when renegotiating a contract at a job you are happy with, is it worth it to test the market? simply to gain negotiating power, you know, basically to see if there's another job out there that's offering more money. He says that's the norm for athletes. Should doctors be doing it too? I, I think you ought to know what the market is paying, which is why the athletes go out there and, and flirt with those other teams, right? So you can utilize market data, which is which is out there, MGMA, AMGA, Sullivan and Cotter. There's a lot of these physician comp surveys, but it, the best offer, right, is a competing offer. It's, it's the hospital down the road, it's the group down the road. And so I think to know what true fair market value is, it, it would be in your best interest to at least take a look. So let's talk about those data sources. I think a lot of people have heard of MGMA data. Can you talk about these data sources and which ones you view as most reliable, where the data comes from, et cetera? Yeah, so the, the data is by and large self-reported by hospitals and groups. They submit their information to MGMA. And 
most of the major health systems will utilize some combination of those uh, in their contracts itself. And that's, you know, for compliance purposes, they have stark and anti-kickback, you know, components and fair market value issues that they've got to deal with. And so they'll often reference MGMA is the one we see most frequently. Um, certain percentiles that you can't exceed, you know, for payment. Um, and you can really utilize that if, if you have that data, you know, to your advantage because they're referencing it as a valid data point. And so if they're not paying you the median, uh, if they're paying you well below where you should be based on your production, um, we find that those are a great source uh, and a great starting point. Do you find that most uh, most initial offers are below median? Almost, in GMA data? almost entirely, yes. <laughs> um, it's, it's rare that in any business, but I mean, in healthcare, there's a lot of dollars here. And so they never come out saying, hey, here's the fairest offer we can give, right? It's always five to 10% below where they want to be. Hmm. All right, let's talk a little bit about malpractice coverage, particularly tail coverage. Now, I hope most doctors are aware of the difference between an occurrence policy and a claims made policy. Um, but obviously, if you get a claims made policy, somebody's got to buy the tail. So that there's some malpractice coverage after you leave the job for events that occurred, but that a claim comes after you leave the job. So right. how sh what should they be looking for in the contracts with respect to tail coverage? Almost every contract will have a paragraph that's specifically about your malpractice insurance. You know, what the amounts are of coverage, what type of policy it is, whether it's claims made or occurrence based. And then also, if it is claims made, who's paying for the tail, who's picking up that cost. Um, there's multiple ways to skin that cat. Um, it's either the employer pays for all of it, you pay for all of it, or there's some type of meat in the middle. And the meat in the middles tend to be based on either longevity and you'll vest into it, kind of like a retirement plan. Every year that you're there, you get 20 to 30% of that covered, or it's based on how the contract terminates. So if you walk away, you pay for it. If they walk away and, and let you go, they'll pay for it, you know, with different caveats for breach and whether you're offered partnership and things like that. So those are the four models you'll see, but there should be a specific paragraph that talks about it. Now, if you're just tuning in, I'm talking with Kyle Clausen of Resolve. He's an attorney that does physician contract reviews. And um, we're taking your questions. So go ahead and type in your questions right into the comments underneath the Facebook Live, and we'll get them answered during this broadcast. Um, but if you don't have questions, I've got plenty of my own, and we'll keep churning through that list. Uh, so let's talk about compensation models. Sure. What you're seeing out there, how it's been changing in the last few years, what uh, should people should know about different compensation models. Yeah. Um, by and large, it's still some type of base compensation with some productivity component tied to that. And the productivity side of that can either be based on work RVUs, it can be based on gross charges or billings, um, and or it can be based on collections. And that really varies based on if you're with the health system or if you're in private practice. Um, it, that being said, on all of those, there will be some type of threshold that you need to cross. And once you've crossed that threshold, you receive a bonus. Um, based on that productivity, whether it's a percentage of collections or a dollar amount per work RVU. Um, those, are, those are by far and away the three most common. The other thing that we're supposed to be starting to see, and some contracts are incorporating it, is these quality bonuses, um, you know, based on patient satisfaction and other things. Uh, that being said, we still don't see that being a very large portion of compensation. It's usually 5% or less. And they're, they're extremely subjective yet, in my opinion. And so most of your comp should be tied to objective measures um, that you can actually report on and um, control. Have you found that you've been able to negotiate that portion out of the contract so that the contract, your payment is not based on quality at all? Can you get that out of the contract, have you found? Or are usually, people that want it in there really stuck on it? Yeah, usually, usually a comp model has been approved, right? And so if they say some percentage has to be tied to quality, they want to leave that there. But if it starts out at 20% of your total comp, you might be able to dial that down to, you know, 10, 15, you know, some lower number that, that you know, you can have at risk and maybe be a little more comfortable with. All right. We got another question coming in from a viewer here. This one comes in from Deanne, who's asking, how much leeway do you have with the Department of Defense or the 
Veterans Administration with contract terms. This is for a doc just getting out of the military. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't see very many VA contracts. And I think the reason is because is they, they don't change them much other than compensation and other than those you know numbers and blanks that they can move. But as far as terms of the contract, they like to keep those very consistent. Hmm. It's one of the few that actually keeps their word on that. Now, for the uh, Department of Defense, I was in charge of, uh, of hiring contractors while I was in there, and I was pretty surprised the differences between what some of them were making. Um, and there were, there were some that were working for much less money than others, I discovered. So I, I don't know how true that is with the Department of Defense. Uh, I think the VA is more of kind of standard contracts, but sure. some, some of these Department of Defense contracts, I suspect there's a little more leeway there. Do you have much experience with those? We, we don't see a lot of DOD contracts, but even the VA would be similar, right? It's the, the contract in and of itself is roughly the same, but the, the dollar amount is a blank that they can change. And that's all supply and demand. So if they have had a hard time, right, and they really need the position, certainly they can pay more. Hmm. All right. Hope that answered your question, Deanne. Um, let's talk about benefits. Let's talk about benefits other than compensation. People want to know what they can expect. What, what should be in a contract? Should they have a CME fund? Should they have health insurance? Should they have life and disability insurance? What benefits are you really seeing in most contracts? Which ones are rare and which ones do you never see? Sure. The health insurance, absolutely. You know, some type of retirement plan and component is very common. C, you know, CE funds should be there. Licensing should be paid for. Board certification costs should be covered, you know, for folks coming out of, of training. Um, signing bonuses, relocation amounts, you know, those are, are very common as well. And then depending on area and, you know, again, supply and demand and how bad they need you, student loan forgiveness is starting to, to show up more um, as, as a tool to recruit because almost everybody now has a, a pretty big dollar number, you know, uh, in those student loans. So those are the, the biggest ones um, that we would see. The, the disability insurances are there. Life insurances are there. The larger the employer, you know, vision, dental, all that stuff. Um, but the core is really retirement, health insurance, and all your, your CE funds. What percentage of the time do you think docs are getting signing bonuses, some sort of money up front at the beginning of the contract, whether it's a, you know, paying for the move or whether it's a signing bonus or whether it's money for student loans, it's all really fungible. It's all the same to the employer, really. But how how many, what percentage of contracts, if you can mm -hmm. estimate, uh, are getting something like that? Yeah, we, about 80% of the contracts we see have some combination of signing bonus and relocation, with relocation being almost 100%. It's very rare that an employer won't pay for that. And I agree with you. It's all the same dollar to them. It's just a matter of what bucket they're going to put it in and how you know much cash they want to part with up front. Okay. Let's talk for a minute about non-competes. Everybody wants to know, are non-competes enforceable? Can you talk a little bit about what a non-compete is sure. um, and, uh, and whether they are enforceable, how you can tell whether they are, what you should do about one that doesn't appear to be enforceable? Mm -hmm. So high level non-competes are <clears throat> promises from the employee you know, or from the physician that say, after this contract ends, I promise not to practice medicine for X number of years for X number of miles around your practice. Okay, so uh, a typical non-compete would be one or two years post-termination, and then the mileage or the restricted territory is going to vary based on location, but 10 miles is a good example. Okay, so whether or not those are enforceable is, is really case by case, and it's, it's all based on if those numbers are reasonable and what they're preventing you from doing, if it's reasonable. There are some states like California and a few others that have by statute said for doctors, those shouldn't be allowed. It violates public policy. Um, most states though, almost every state is whether or not it's reasonable for you. So unfortunately there's no broad brush that can paint over all those. Let's take a question from Ka now, who's asking how negotiable are contracts in academia? Do mm -hmm. they ever match MGMA as the median is usually uh, low for ACA. I'm not sure what he's asking there at the end, but they, do they match yeah. the MGA data if you're going into uh, if you're going into academia or should you just expect less money? Well, MGMA has an academic report. So if you're talking about that report, yes, they should be matching the median. If you're looking at the non-academic report, yeah, it's usually almost, you know, in 20 to 30 percent less sometimes. So uh, if they're looking at the right data points, they should be looking to, to match that. The, the contracts are negotiable. 
and it, again, it's I hate to keep saying case by case, but we just had a contract yesterday where you know there was four or five different paragraphs adjusted. You know, compensation was changed. That being said, there are others that have less leverage that they'll tell you it's it's not changeable. It's our standard, and they'll stick to that. So you really have to ask the questions to know whether or not they're going to make the adjustments. Let's talk about that for a minute. A lot of doctors get this line. It's a standard contract. Yeah. How true is that? Uh, we find that it's rarely true. So every employer, academics or not, is going to tell you this is the, the same contract all your colleagues have signed, right? The last 10 hires have signed it. We have to be fair to everyone, um, which is, is physicians really like that terminology of, of being fair. And so sometimes that'll cause a negotiation to stop. Um, it's interesting on this side of it when you see the volumes that we do, because we'll have contracts in the same location, same specialty that are offered to two different people and they have different numbers allocated uh, in them. Or you'll deal with HCA uh, in Dallas for cardiology and you'll find out that the last guy got $55 per worker hour you and the new guy they're hiring is getting 50. And they're saying, no, that's our standard number. Um, it, it's, it's rarely true. And so if you've got the information, if you've got the leverage, you can really push on that. All right. Let's go to a question from Michael, who's asking, how fungible do uh, employers really look at those funds? For example, if they don't need relocation, is that money easily shifted in the contract to a sign-on bonus or some other area? Um, they don't like to. They like to say, if you don't need it, they get to save it. Um, th that being said, you know, if it was available up front, unless it's a really, really large employer that absolutely can't shift it to a different bucket. Um, we almost always see them willing to do that. All right. Let's take a question from Karen, who's asking, are there usually penalties for terminating a contract early if things don't work out? Can you give us some examples of what the penalties might be? Yeah, it depends. So if this is, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but the termination without cause component in your contract will give you the notice period that you need to give them. Uh, so most contracts is 90 days. Uh, if you don't give them that 90 days and you're then in breach of contract, the damage is going to be whatever it costs them to replace you, you know, for the time period out. And then if it's, if it's more expensive than what it was costing them to pay you, that difference is one of the damage, you know, components that they would be asking for. So if you're in breach of contract, it's no different than if they're in breach of contract, they have the obligation to mitigate their damage and then to ask you to cover the difference. So um, if, if your contract, isn't you know structured that way sometimes there will also be a liquidated damages provision that says you owe us x number of dollars per day right a thousand dollars per day if you leave early um so i i don't like those as much uh, we'd rather force them to prove their damage but it can be written either way okay. so let's talk just for a minute about negotiation you mentioned the doctors tend to stop negotiating when someone throws out the word fair mm -hmm. a lot of doctors wonder how hard should I negotiate? Can I negotiate? Is something even negotiable? Can you talk for a little bit about negotiation in general of physician contracts mm -hmm. and uh, the mistakes the typical physician makes? Yeah. First of all, every contract is negotiable. Uh, you may have to start before you get to the contract stage. I mean, once they actually deliver the document, it may be that you've lost all your leverage. And that's the biggest concern and the biggest problem that we see most often is that they interviewed at five or six spots. They had offers from three. They turned down the other two because they found their favorite. And now they want to push all the terms as hard as they can without anything to fall back on. And in that process, when they interviewed, they may have told the realtor and the secretary that they're absolutely coming there and their wife has to be there and all these you know, different things. Um, all of that information gets back to administration and they're making decisions on whether or not they need to spend more of their dollars on you. So you've got to keep that leverage. You've got to stop, you know, dropping option B and C too early and really make sure that you're able to push and ask those questions. You should be doing it early on in the process, especially around compensation. Okay. Let's talk for a minute. A lot of uh, physician jobs involve supervising advanced practice clinicians like PAs and nurse practitioners. Can you talk for a little bit about uh, about what to do about those sections of a contract or maybe there's nothing in the contract about it, but you find out that it's expected at the job. Uh, can you talk about maybe getting compensated more for doing that supervision and, and what you can do around that issue with the contract? Sure. Yeah. You, you want to have control over that, whether or not it's your obligation to supervise and collaborate with 
you know, any type of mid-level provider. And also the compensation that we see is either based on a percentage of their production. So some of that comes back to you and feeds your bonus pool, or it's a flat dollar amount per year. Um, either of those two models can work. And if it's, if it's mandated, for sure, you want to know how you're paid for that. If, if it's completely up to you, sometimes you can negotiate those terms later on, you know, once you've agreed to, to supervise it. All right. We got some questions pouring in here. Let's take a few from the audience here. Um, geez, they're moving so fast. I can't even read them. All right. So here's a question from Yogesh who's asking, how do we get the information about other people's contracts? Like you talked about in the cardiology example in Dallas. <laughs> Uh, unless they're your friend and they're willing to share their contracts. Uh, there's no public data source for this. So if you engage a company like ours that has a lot of you know, contracts, that's one way to do it. Um, you can try to utilize um, you know, MGMA to the best of your ability, but even that's not gonna tell you, you know, what you know, the last guy got. And, and again, to truly know fair market value, you need to go out and, and talk to four to five different practices in Dallas if that's where you wanna be and try to get offers from them. And so that that's really the, the true market. It's no different than selling a house, right? It's what somebody willing to pay for it. You don't know until you go out and, and, and ask the question. So you're gonna have to either hire a company that has access to that data um, or go out and get interviews from everybody in town. Okay. Here's another question from a viewer who's asking, is it appropriate to include staffing in the contract? Meaning how many nurses, how many mid-levels I get, et cetera. And should you always negotiate for more? If you need more, <laughs> there's a paragraph that's going to say, we're going to provide you with reasonable equipment and personnel. You know, they want you to be successful. They want you to produce revenue. They want you to be efficient. Um, the question is, is if there's minimum things, you know, I have to have at least a scribe, at least, you know, one nurse, at least one MA, whatever it is. Um, that type of thing should be in the contract. On the equipment side, if you're the first person right in this location, you're the first ENT coming into a practice and, and there's a certain scope or, you know, anything else that you would need, that type of thing I would also want to have in the contract because that, for me, would be a real deal deal breaker if they didn't have the, the things that I need to utilize. So. The answer is maybe if it's important to you specifically. All right. We've got a couple of questions coming in now from uh, a couple of viewers about non-competes. So let's go back to non-competes for a moment. Okay. Braden is asking, how do you navigate or avoid a non-compete clause when you're moving to a new area and are employers ever accepting of not having a non-compete at all? Sometimes, not usually. Um, if they start out with a non-compete in the contract, it's really difficult to remove it entirely. So your your best bet is to try to poke as many holes in that thing as you can to reduce the time period, to reduce the geographic area, to reduce the scope. If you're internal medicine and cardiology, can they at least limit it to just cardiology? You know, that type of thing. Not that those are great options, but it's still an option to, to allow you to stay in the area and not have to leave. So... Um, you can navigate them. You can ask them to reduce it. We see adjustments very frequently, especially around termination items. You know, if you terminate me without cause, you let me go wherever, you know, I want to. Uh, if you're bought out, right, if private equity comes in and swoops up the practice or if a hospital comes in and merges, um, you know, can you release me from the non-compete in those situations if you can't do anything else? Uh, we see that type of thing all the time. Okay, and this one uh, from Adnan, who's asking on leaving a practice, does a non-compete distance radius apply to just one's primary office location where one practice, or does it apply to not being able to practice from any of that medical group's locations? Usually it's from any group, that's how the language is written, but you're gonna have to check your contract specifically. Um, that's one issue, especially with all the consolidation that we're seeing and all these health systems that are really large, if they're saying four miles from every single facility that they have, I mean, that can really be a hundred miles, not four miles, right? And so um, most contracts start out saying from every location, you're gonna to wanna to try to dial that into just yours if you can. Okay, all right, here's a unique question. Uh, this one's coming from Mary, who's asking, do any contracts allow student loan repayment for tuition paid through family loans? So can you take, you know, student loan money that's designated for that in the contract and pay it to the bank of mom and dad? Not usually. That's, we, we do see that question. Most employers were really uncomfortable with that. 
um, they want to, you know, see a valid lender because it's, um, it's not the typical way that they go through that process. So sometimes what we'll see is a community need loan or a, you know, retention bonus instead of a student loan, you know, payment in that situation. Um, so the answer is generally no, uh, for that question. Can you talk a little bit about some of the, this offer that I've seen a lot of docs ask about where they basically get some sort of loan from the practice um, and then the loans gradually forgiven over five years? Is that a good thing to have in a contract? Is that bad? Uh, what are your thoughts on, on a, a loan from the practice that is gradually forgiven to you as you're kind of vested into the practice? Well, there's two things on that. One is, is it good or bad? It depends on what happens. So if you're there for all five years and they forgive the whole thing, it's just a big signing bonus that you've taken early and hopefully you've invested it or paid off your student loans or something else and, and it's it's fine. The problem comes is if you need to leave early and you don't have that cash that's liquid anymore, um, how you go about turning around and repaying whatever portion of that needs to be repaid. Um, there's usually interest that's running on that as well. And so it turns into this phantom income you know, issue as well where they forgive it, you know, even if, if let's use a hundred thousand dollars, for example, over five years, so they're going to forgive $20,000 a year, but there's also this prime plus two interest running on it. Um, all of that's taxable to you once it's forgiven and you don't have the cash that year because you've received it, you know, two, three years previous. So they're not bad, but you do have to do some extra planning around it to make sure you're ready for all the tax issues and all the potential repayment issues that might come up. All right, so we've got 60 people watching this live now. So welcome to all of you. If you're just tuning in, I'm talking with Kyle Clausen of Resolve Physician Agency. He's an expert in physician contract review and in negotiation of physician contracts. Can you talk for just a minute about what you guys do if somebody comes to you and wants, wants your full service? What do you offer to them? Do you negotiate the contract for them or, or how does it work really? Yeah. So the, the first thing we do is obviously we have them submit their information to us with the contract, with questions that they've got. Um, they then have a phone call with an attorney to make sure we understand their situation. So it's no different than a new patient coming in for you guys. We want to know what the history is, how far along in the process they are, um, how many other offers they may or may not have and what their goals are You know, with the negotiation. And then at that point, we turn around a red line document to them that says, here's the good, the bad, you know, the ugly in this thing, we provide them compensation data uh, and analysis on that. And then from there, it's, it's really up to the client on if they want to have us negotiate or if they want to kind of take that portion over themselves. We find it's about 50-50. You know, some clients want to do it themselves. Some clients really want to step away from it. So either of those things is, is available, you know, to them. And then hopefully we can work it through to a resolution, you know, fairly quickly so they can say yes or no to it. Do you get a sense that it pisses off a practice or a hospital if you're stepping in doing the negotiation? Is that viewed negatively in any way or? Um, no, it, it's rarely viewed negatively. I shouldn't say never, but um, all of the health systems for sure have administrators and you know legal teams and things like that that are doing this all day, every day. And so they, they have no issue with it. Sometimes if it's a small private group, we will actually encourage you, the client to say, hey, if you're maybe going into partnership with these guys in two years, it'd be a good step in that process to see how they interact with you in the negotiation, to see, you know, you delivering, you know, hard questions to them. Um, if, if the client's still really uncomfortable with that, however, we're happy to do it um, to deal with the practices, law firm or, or whoever on their side. Okay. Let's take a question now from Michael, who's asking, how about compensation for graduate medical education? Is it strictly by hours? And I think he's talking about uh, teaching residents, you know, compensation for teaching residents. Hmm. Uh, what's the best way to, to get that in your contract? Yeah, it, it would usually be by the hour and or if it's in an academic setting, there's a, a time allocation. So, you know, 70% of my time is for clinical work and then the other 30 is for teaching and research and things like that. So um, it, it can be if it's an extra, uh, it can be hourly. If, if not, it's just built into your base of the time allocation. Okay. Let's go into Karen's question here uh, because it's related. She's asking, what's a normal compensation structure for teaching? Yeah. Um, it's, it's almost the, the same as anywhere else. It's just where they're getting the funding from. And so it, there's always a base component to it. There's usually some type of production, whether that's pooled, you know, with the entire uh, division or not. 
um, or just you individually, but almost all of them will have those two components that are there. She also wonders how many options should you narrow it down to before starting to seriously negotiate in general? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. She's saying, uh, should you be negotiating with six, uh, six different jobs or, or maybe only two or three? Six is probably too many uh, because it's hard to make a decision on six. I, I always encourage you to have about three that you would absolutely say yes to if the terms were right. And sometimes you can't get that many because the locations just aren't hiring, but that would be the, the right number for me. Okay. Let's talk for a minute about scheduling. How much detail needs to be included in the contract about scheduling? I think we're talking about what days you work, uh, you know, what your hours are, how the holidays are divided. Um, how much call you have, how much detail should be in the contract based on that? Yeah, you can do one of two things. You can either get really detailed and say, you know, here's the days of the week I'm working, here's the hours I'm working. And some places do that. You know, I work eight to five this day and I work nine to seven the next day. Um, or you can be extremely broad and say that we're going to mutually agree to schedule. Uh, we're going to take call equally, um, including holidays. Uh, we're only going to work at these locations. And if you want to change location, you have to get my consent for it. That's an easy way to protect you, the client in that and without pigeonholing them into too much detail because they that's always their response. We don't want to detail it because what if we want to change it? What if it switches a half hour here or there? Um, but you can't let them dictate and control all that either. Now, I recently had a question from a doc who had basically had that second type of contract that will take call equally, et cetera. <laughs> And then he discovered that there were people in the group that weren't taking call at all or weren't taking as much call. What do you do at that point? I mean, do you do you try to prosecute the group for breach of contract or or what's the approach once you're in the job and you realize they aren't following the contract? Well, that's that's the question, right? Is you only pull the contract out if, if somebody's unhappy. Otherwise, it just sits in the drawer. And so in that situation, you know, if you're if they're technically in breach of contract, I'd be bringing that up that we were supposed to share it equally. We're not anymore. And so, you know, if I'm taking more call, I should be compensated for it or I should be allowed to just not take it. Now, there's obviously politics involved with that. And the type of group, I think, would depend on how hard you push that. If you're trying to become a partner, if this is just a, a health system where it's purely, you know, an employed model. So how, the situation would dictate my advice on that, of, of what they should do, but they're absolutely in breach of contract. Let's talk about moonlighting and side gigs. Uh, yeah. Should something about the, that be in a contract? Is it okay if it's not in the contract, you can do whatever you want? And what about for academics? If they want to do something on the side, do they owe the money from it to their employer? Uh, can you talk about that portion of contracts and that portion of jobs? Yep, there should be an outside activities or exclusive service paragraph is how they're usually titled. And almost all contracts start out saying that you owe us 100% of your time, you know, we're your employer. If you want to do something else, you've got to get our consent to do that. And most docs don't want to get their consent. They want to go out and, you know, do whatever they want on the side. So we would we would prefer that the language is flipped, right? That it's you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, keep all the revenue from it, unless it starts to conflict with our contract here or unless it's a direct conflict, you know, with us as, a, as an employer, um, you know, it's, it's 100% allowed. So you need to pay attention to it. Uh, or else the revenue and the permission is going to be completely controlled by them. Can you talk a little bit? I mean, you do this all over the country, right? What, what variations have you seen in physician income from one region of the country to another or from one size city to a small town, et cetera? Yeah. Different regions, probably not as big of a deal as the size of the town. So New York, San Diego's, Houston's, you, you make less there than you do in South Dakota or Iowa, right? A more rural setting. And again, that's that's supply and demand. There are certain regions of the country, the Midwest and the South tend to make more across almost all specialties because there is different in, differences in reimbursements. But um, far and away, it's, it, it's just purely the size of the city and how many applicants they can expect to have. You know, there's a lot of people that want to live in Denver, San Diego, et cetera. Not as many people want to live in you know, Bismarck, North Dakota. And so the, the compensation is going to be sometimes 50, 60, 70% higher in those locations from what's being offered just purely based on that. Now, is that only for employee jobs? Does it really change that much if you're a partner in a group? It does. Yeah. So, I mean, we see, 
you know, private practices that are paying, you know, low 100s, right, in big cities and, and the same type of practice would pay low 200s uh, in, in a rural setting. So um, it could be pretty dramatic. All right, we got another question coming in from a reader here, uh, or a viewer, I suppose is the right way to say it. How do you negotiate getting ongoing education, such as getting an MBA or an MHA within your contract once you have already started working for an employer? Uh, it's difficult. I think you've got to show some type of value add that's going to bring, and or that you're being paid below you know, fair market value on these surveys. And so that in lieu of additional compensation, you want to take that instead. Uh, a, a lot of contracts will have some type of tuition component built into the, the CE dollars where, you know, again, after X number of years, you get this kind of lump sum to, to do that. But that usually is negotiated up front. It's not not once you're in the contract. So you need to find your leverage point. Uh, and hopefully, I mean, not hopefully, but if, if you're being paid less than fair market value, that would be a good reason to, to make that request. Hmm. Uh, a related question comes from Jared, who's asking, after the first contract, is there still room to negotiate when you re-sign? Can you talk a little bit about that? Let's say you're a year in and it's time to renegotiate the contract. How do you approach that? Yeah. So uh, the nice thing about that is you'll have some data, you know, some local personal data at that point that you can compare. And so hopefully you're exceeding the thresholds that they've set for you. And if you're you know, being paid 200,000, let's say, and your production shows up that you should be making 250, you can utilize that and, uh, and lean on them uh, in that manner. If not, we had the question before about, should I go and look, you know, like an athlete, should I go out and get a couple other offers every time I need to renegotiate? My answer to that is yes, at least know the market, you know, know what's out there. Uh, so that way you can make a good decision and, and inform them if they don't know, you know, what the competition is doing. Hmm. Xander has a question. What's the difference between a contract and an offer letter? I know we mentioned that earlier. I don't know if Xander was watching that or not, um, but he's wondering if it's normal to just have the offer letter without a contract. Yeah, offer letter, term sheet, letter of intent, all those can be the same things. Uh, it's usually the first step in the contracting process where you lay out the high level terms, You know, 10 to 15 bullets. They can be binding, they can be the contract in certain situations, but most often it's just a first step to getting a full document. Okay. For those just tuning in here, and I see there's about uh, 60 of you online right now, I'm talking with Kyle Clausen of Resolve Physician Agency. He's an expert in physician contract reviews and physician contract negotiations. So if you need any help with your contracts, you can see the URL scrolling along the bottom of the screen there. But we're just here doing this Facebook Live in the White Coat Investor Facebook group, answering your questions tonight. So feel free to type them in and we'll get them all answered uh, for as long as we have time tonight. Uh, Tim has the next question. He wants to know, how do you know fair market value for call or salary? I think particularly for call, we've talked a little bit about that for salary using those uh, uh, survey data like MGMA. But what about for call? How do you know what call is worth? Yeah, uh, the nice thing is, is those surveys also have call medians, you know, for uh, different regions and for different specialties. So that would be your first, you know, step uh, is to take a look at those. Um, beyond that, again, uh, if you're if you're looking for data that's outside of the survey, if you're hiring a company to take a look at your fair market value, they should have comps, you know, either in the area and or um, something that's regional that, that would give you an idea of what's fair. So do you find that most docs that are going to be taking ER call are able to get compensated for it these days? What specialties are getting paid? What specialties aren't getting paid? Y yeah, I mean... The, the surgery specialties for sure, it depends on how much call they're taking, right? So there's usually an expectation with your base salary that you're going to take an equitable amount or the hospital bylaws will require 10 days a month, you know, that type of thing. Uh, it's the call in excess of that that's usually paid. Um, you know, the, it ranges on the low end from $500 a day to we see, you know, up to maybe $2,500 a day, depending on the specialty, you know, for trauma type things. So, um, Anything beyond one and three for sure, you should be asking the question on how do I get paid for that? Okay. Now, Frankie's got an interesting question. It sounds like a very specific question, but he's asking, what about a true hospital employed position in a predominantly outpatient specialty mm -hmm. where they ask if the doc is willing to take a hospital consult for an inpatient 
Should the doc ask to be compensated on a per consult basis? Since a lot of the consults are spent just answering questions from the hospitalist on the phone. I mean, how do you get compensated for that? Yeah, we just did one of these actually where um, we gave them a six, you know, work RVU credit for every consult that they did. And so you can, you can quantify it and, and try to, you know, work at any different type of compensation model. You could find a way to get paid for that. Um, but my answer would be yes, you do need to be asking about this is my time. How do I, how do I get compensation for it? All right, let's talk for a minute about horror stories. Hmm. Um, you know, this is what makes a lot of docs worry and, and maybe what makes a lot of docs look to get their contracts evaluated is they hear these horror stories. What are some of the bad things that happen to docs who, who don't take this process seriously and end up in a, in a job they don't like with a bad contract? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll give you two of them. The first one is back to the biggest red flag we talked about initially is that we've had clients sign documents that they assume they can break or they, they assume they can get out of while they're looking for something else or they find the pie in the sky job, you know, six months after being there and there's no termination without cause component in them. And so you're stuck there for maybe three years when you thought you could just leave at any time uh, or you're stuck there for three years before you even start um, because you found something else. So that's that's the first horror story. The second one is, is just not reading and evaluating the terms specifically around the non-compete. Uh, we had a client that left training, took a job with a private practice, started the job, and on day four, the suits walked in and said, "Hey, congratulations! Uh, we just sold out, you know, to this health system, um, and here's your new contract. And if you don't like it, we're going to terminate you without cause. And oh, by the way, your non-compete applies, so you're going to leave town." And she had been there for four days. And so, you know, is that enforceable if she brought it to a judge? Probably not, right? But do you want to spend the money and the time to go through fighting a health system on a non-compete? Uh, the answer is no. It's going to be really expensive. And so, you know, understanding what she was signing would have been something really beneficial. Uh, and then also, obviously, changing those terms would have been the right thing to do. So th those two come to mind off the top of my head. Hmm. What percentage of doctors do you think are currently underpaid compared to what they could be making if they had done a better job negotiating? Uh, I would say over half. I, almost every resident coming, I mean, almost every contract we see, we talked about this before, starts out below median. And so um, that in and of itself is a problem. The other problem that I see as more and more physicians become employed and as more and more employers become concerned about stark and fair market values, they're putting these compensation caps in the contract saying you can't ever exceed the 75th percentile or you can't ever exceed the 90th percentile. And what that does over a 10 or 20 year period, you know, anybody that's taking statistics knows that you can't take the 100 percentile and push it down without having a, a pretty bad consequence for, for everybody else. So um, I, I think a lot uh, are underpaid and I, I don't know the exact percentage, but I'd say it's well over 50 percent. Hmm. All right. Got another question coming in from the audience here. Uh, this one from Adnan, who's asking, how common is it to sign a final contract? and then be told that you won't get the countersigned contract back to your first day. He says a group has told him that that's how they have done it with all 700 of their prior docs. Not common. Um, <laughs> until, until you've got the contract signed by both parties, uh, you don't have a contract. So th to me, that would be a red flag. I would, I would demand that they give you the contract. Uh, if not, I would I'd inform them that you're still looking for other options as well if they can't commit to you. Yeah, that seems bizarre. I don't think I'd pack the moving truck without a signed contract. Yeah, no, no thanks. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Okay, uh, someone's asking here, let's see, who is this? This is uh, Rajan who's asking, any things that one should watch out for for a clinical research contract? Mm. Um, it, depending on if it's a 100% or not, it's, it's time allocation, protecting that time is the biggest concern that I usually get is that they told me I'd have 20% right in my time for research or 70% uh, for research and I'm not, you know, they're, they're utilizing me for other things. So that, that would be the biggest concern that I would have is making sure it's protected. Hmm. So Ka has another question, uh, similar to one we had earlier, are contract renewals treated as fresh contracts, i.e. are they up for renegotiation just like a new one? Why don't you talk about what your firm can do uh, for a renegotiation? Is this common for people to come to you, you know, a year later or two years later uh, for your assistance, uh, like it is often for a new residency grad getting their first contract? 
It is. Yeah. And the, the nice thing is, is that you'll know them and you'll know whether or not they're treating you fairly or not at that point in time. You'll have your own internal data that we can analyze uh, to decide if you're being paid fairly. Uh, and we can also see your trends. Right. So if you're really you know, trending towards the 60th, 70th percentile, well, that's where you'd like to see your compensation set for the next two, three years. You don't want to set up the median any longer because then you'll still be underpaid. So um, I think it's a really important, maybe you're only focusing on compensation at that point in time, but there may be other things that come up too. If it's, you know, you're planning, you know, family planning uh, with maternity leave that you need to negotiate now that you didn't before. Um, if it's, you know, any other type of compensation item, I mean, all those things are important, but the fact that you have your own data is, is what's really helpful. Okay. Our next question comes from Joey, who says he's a locum tenens intensivist. Mm -hmm. And when working with the big locum tenens companies, any specific contract details to watch out for? Uh, tips for locums docs. Yeah, I'd be careful on the, the non-solicitation, non-compete component there, because what they're really concerned about is that you go take this locum position and then the, the facility cuts them out and then hires you directly, right? And so most of those contracts will have some type of penalty built in for that and in time period that where they can't touch you. So I'd, I'd be really careful in making sure you know what you're signing on that. And then also the ability to, to set your schedule and to get out of it on a shorter time period. You shouldn't have to give them six months notice. It's usually a 30 day type notice on those types of contracts. So uh, flexibility and then knowing where you can go once you're done. So how, how long is typical that the locums company has you locked up? Do they have you locked up for 90 days or 180 days or what's kind of normal there? Uh, usually 30 to 60 is what we see in locum contracts. It's most common that it's 90 to 120 in a full-time employed contract, but almost half of that in a locum you know, position. So, I mean, if you, you're there for 60 days, you can go directly to the hospital, cut out the middleman and, and maybe get a little more pay while saving the hospital money. Um, well, except that their non-computer non-solicitation is usually a year or two after the fact. So a year that, or two. Okay. Yeah, sorry, right. I just understood the question. So, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think I communicated it very well. So, yeah, usually a year or two. Okay. So, here's a question from Anish. Okay. For a hospital employed position based on production, do you mm -hmm. find a significant difference in compensation on dollars per WRVU basis versus collections minus expenses? Yeah. Um, you know, collections minus expenses, you, you care about who the payer is, right? And, and what your payer mix looks like on a work RVU system, you don't. Your, the work RVU credit is the same regardless of if they pay or if they don't. So uh, my answer is yes. Most hospital employee positions are almost always work RVU. We rarely see them on collections. Collections are mostly for private groups at this point. So I'd, I'd be surprised if that's something that they'd want to implement. Here's a good question. This is relates a little bit to my uh, issue I had when I came into my group. Uh, this one comes from Rajan, who's asking about non-competes for hospitalists. Yeah, We never own the patients. Why do they have these in our contracts at all, he's asking. I agree. I think for certain specialties, uh, ER, hospitalists, um, th there's really no justification, in my opinion, for that. Um, what they'll tell you is that they've recruited you to town and they don't want you to leave and go across town because that's that's costly. Um, but non-competes are not for that. Non-competes are to protect an employer from you taking patients and taking business away from them. And so I agree with you. I think you, you do have greater leverage in getting them removed in those types of situations versus a ophthalmology, dermatology type practice where you can just pick up the patients and walk them across the street if you need to. Yeah, I can tell you about my experience with that, Rajan. When I came to my group, they had a non-compete. And I said, why do you have this non-compete? And when we got right down to it, their concern was that I not steal the contract with the hospital from the group. But the non-compete was written basically broadly. It would have kept me if, if they fired me from going five miles down the street and working in another ER. And so I just said, well, let's just write it for what you're actually concerned about, because obviously it's not a business issue if I go down to the hospital down the street. And so we rewrote the non-compete. So it basically just said I couldn't take that contract with the hospital. And everybody was happy with that. All right, let's take another question here. This one um, 
What do you think is the frequency of an actual contractual issue among physicians? This doc has a sense that it's really low. Um, he's been practicing for a while and doesn't really know anybody who's had a major contractual issue as a doc. Is he just been lucky or is he not paying attention? Uh, I guess I'd want to know the definition of a major contractual. <laughs> so, I Spoken don't... like a true attorney. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll dodge that. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, unfortunately for you know, for us, I guess we see a lot of folks come through for exit type consultations, meaning they're going to leave and they're worried about something in their contract. So I don't know that that's a dispute necessarily, but, you know, there's roughly, you know, a hundred thousand plus doctors that move every year from one job to the next. And so I, I think that that means that there are contractual issues, whether they're getting litigated or not, is something completely different. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. We got just about eight minutes left in this. So if you have questions for Kyle or I, please get them in. Just type them in underneath the uh, underneath the Facebook Live there in the comments section. Um, okay. Here's one. Uh, this is more a comment, it sounds like, than a question. This one is coming in from uh, uh, Tracy, who's saying... Hang on, I just lost my place here. All right, so Tracy's asking, pediatrics is starting fellowship board certification for hospitalist positions. What do you think the actual pay difference is or will be for those who are board certified? Uh, I think she's asking, is it worthwhile to do a hospitalist fellowship in order to get paid more for being board certified as a pediatric hospitalist? Do you have any sense for that? Whether you're better off as a general pediatrician being... Uh, working mm. as a hospitalist or taking that extra year in training and actually getting that board certification as a pediatric hospitalist? Yeah, I I think that's a really hard question to answer, first of all, but I, I'm going to tend to say, I don't think they're going to value it real high. Um, you know, unfortunately, what your uh, resume says and what, what you have on it doesn't really affect the collections that come in and the revenue behind anything in medicine. And so, you know, we get this question, even aside from training, you know, somebody from Harvard versus somebody from a, a lower ranked, you know, program, you know, there may be a little difference there, but that whole year of you being in training versus a whole year of you earning a, a physician's income, you know, I, I'm not sure how that plays out uh, over the course of your career, but I, I don't think there's going to be much bump in comp. That's my, inclination. I don't know if that's going to be true or not, but I would, I would tend to say no. My general impression of hospitalists is, is that they're always trying to get more hospitalists because it's a hard job. So I, I, my sense is that, uh, you know, if you're willing to do it and you are at least minimally qualified, they'll take you, but maybe in a, in a really competitive place, um, you know, you go into a Denver or a San Diego, maybe it's, uh, that little extra bit of training will help. I don't know. Sure. All right, so Atul is asking about service line agreement for private GI groups and hospitals. Are you seeing a rising trend in this for new hires? What resources do you use to develop a service line agreement? And can you just explain what that is? Because I don't even know what he's talking about. Do you know what a service line agreement is? Um, I've, I've seen them called professional service agreements. I think that's what he may be saying, where the, the hospital or the health system contracts with a private group to provide service you know, at, a, at a group level rather than at an individual level. Um, there, there's not a lot of data that I'm aware of that would tell you what those are supposed to look like, right? Um, you know, I think what you would do is you take a look at what, you know, the number of providers in your group and you still utilize MGMA numbers to, to show what, you know, that call, you know, coverage is worth, you know, to them, if that's what it is. Um, but there's no, as far as I'm aware of, there's no data point that says, here's what fair market value is. Okay. All right, Jared is asking, have you seen problems with earnings from non-medical sources such as a novel or an invention or maybe a blog? <laughs> yeah, specifically a blog. Um, <laughs> a lot of contracts will have intellectual property components in them that says, you know, anything that you develop while you're under contract with this is ours. And so unless we've given you approval to do it outside, it's kind of that outside activities discussion we had before. Um, you, you'd, you'd like to make sure that language is clear and also to carve out that any intellectual property that you develop on your own time with your own resources is yours 100%. Um, some contracts will split that, you know, and say it's 50-50 or, or some other allocation. Um, if you have interest in that, you really need to, to pay attention to it and carve it out. Yeah, what I suspect happens is people develop an interest after a few years. Yeah. Uh, and then they find that, that, that they didn't even read their contract, didn't realize they owe some of that money to their employer. Yeah. 
Tim has a question about the mechanics of negotiations. You know, how does it actually work? How long do the negotiations commonly take? What should they expect from the negotiation process? Sure. Uh, my philosophy on negotiations is, is that you should come in with all of your requests in one, one document. Okay. And so if you've got 10 items, you should be presenting all 10 items at the same time. So you can get yes or no's to those and then prioritize if there are no's, if there's deal breakers for you that you can go back and say, okay, I need X, Y, or Z uh, before we move forward on this. It can take anywhere from two days to two months. And that's unfortunately the, the hard truth. Um, the, the bigger the system, the longer it takes, they'll have to get you know approval from legal aside from the business folks. And so the average is probably two weeks you know, from the time you start to the time you finish, but it can be anywhere in between. Yeah. Karen wants to know how many back and forths are reasonable. If you're on your dozenth back and forth, have you have you kind of pushed your limit or or how many yeah. are reasonable? Yeah, there's diminishing returns with every round. So you're going to get the most movement the first time. And then after that, you may get one or two things. And then after that, probably nothing. So I, I would say if you're past round two, honestly, and you brought everything to the table the first time, you, you need to make a decision, yes or no. Yeah. Okay, here's a question coming from the other side. This one's coming from Chris who's mm -hmm. asking, as a practice owner, is it naive to forego a non-compete clause for a new associate? Uh, it depends on the specialty, I think. And I would also say, yes, you know, if you've got a market that's that you want to control, I would want some type of non-compete in there as long as it's reasonable, you know, and as long as you're treating them fairly, I would absolutely advocate, you know, for most owners to try to have one in. Um, but it, it, it's got to be small. It can't be a blanket over the whole town. You can't force people to move. You can't use it as an offensive tool, right? I mean, it's supposed to be there just to protect you as a defensive tool if they leave you. That's a good way to think about it. I like that offense versus defense. All right. Michael's got a question about coming out of the military. Any special considerations or leverage for leaving the military and negotiating a contract or any particular areas where I have additional leverage to improve my contract? I, I don't have any additional leverage. I, I think that your leverage is the same. The fact that there's, you know, this underserved uh, market that you guys happen to be in uh, is great. If there's any specific experience you have around trauma or ER, I mean, anything that, you know, you could convey to get into those harder markets, maybe. Um, but otherwise, I don't see that any different really than, than anybody else. You know, Michael, my experience, and I worried about this because a lot of docs in the military are taking care of relatively low acuity patients. And we're worried that someone else is going to look at that and know that and, and not want to bring us in because we haven't done as many intubations or chest tubes or surgeries or whatever. Um, and I found that people just didn't care, uh, number one. And number two, they assumed good things about you coming from the military. So for me, it was entirely positive. I was definitely put a notch above people coming out of residency by having had a few years experience in the military. So I, I would not expect downsides. I would expect all positives from your military service. Uh, I was very surprised about that, but that's the way it seemed to work out for me. All right, just time for maybe one more question here and I got a lot to choose from. So let me see if I can pick the best one here. Um, does contract negotiation look different for telemedicine work? I'm curious if the physician tends to have less bargaining power since the company could hire from physicians from many locations, or is there anything else you should specifically look for in a telemedicine contract? Mm -hmm. I, I don't find that you have less leverage. I mean, I think that you're right that the pool potentially is bigger, but I, I, I worry about the non-compete, non-solicitation components in those as well, because um, there is no physical location right that we're drawing this radius from and so sometimes what they'll do is they'll try to blanket it to other companies like us right and that's that's really i, I think an unfair you know type of clause so um that nothing different i think your comp you know discussion will, will be difficult you know you may have to have multiple offers to compare there's not mgma data you know yet for telemedicine and, and for what that looks like so it depends on what you're doing for them but pay pay real close attention to the to the non-compete non-solicitation components Okay, we better wrap this up. I promised him I'd keep this to under an hour and we're just over an hour now. So I wanted to say thank you, Kyle, for coming on and sharing all this knowledge so freely with the group. Thank you for sponsoring the Facebook group. We're very grateful to have you here. He is in the Facebook group. Uh, so you can hunt him down in there and continue to ask your questions. I know there's four or five here we haven't gotten to at the end, but you can also contact him at resolve.net. 
This is his business. This is what he does. If you need help with your contract, you got negotiations uh, or you got uh, questions about your contract. This is what he does all day. So go there, make an appointment for just a few hundred dollars. You might save yourself tens of thousands of dollars uh, or rather make tens of thousands of dollars by getting that contract reviewed before you make a mistake. Uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. This will be available in the Facebook group. We'll also get it up on YouTube in the next few days. And uh, we'll see you next time when we do a Facebook Live here in the White Coat Investor Group. Thank you.